Annie Eisenberg, the author of Shoptimism. Well, you know, the American character, I mean, we, I think we've got it into our head now that we are a nation of shopaholics, you know, that, that we are all uh, incredibly greedy. Uh, we don't know our limits. And that's true. A lot of us don't know our limits. And, you know, the, the economic meltdown that we've experienced uh, the last couple of years is to a very large degree uh, because, you know, our eyes were bigger than our wallets. Uh, but I think that's a mischaracterization in some ways. I think that's too broad a, an indictment of, of, of the American people overall. Uh, but I also think it's, it's rooted in this very strong um, conflict that you know, exists and has existed in the American character. Uh, you know, as, as we all remember from school, if not from uh, buying experience, uh, we were really a nation founded on frugality and you know, waste not, was, want not, you know, the Benjamin Franklin credo and, and a century or two uh, in which good character was defined by uh, not spending money, but by abstinence. And then beginning in the 19th century, uh, things began to change in a very accelerated and radical way. Uh, global industrialization brought all kinds of goods that were increasingly affordable to more and more people. Uh, beginning in the uh, early uh, 19th century, and you had these uh, actually not far from uh, this studio, uh, just around the block on the street, in fact, uh, these incredible uh, department stores uh, in the form of uh, Italian palazzos uh, that started springing up in the early 1900s, where not only the upper class, but working class men and women could come into these fantastic uh, emporia piled high with goods from all over the world, and, and we had never seen anything like that before. Uh, and the department store, as we, had, as we came to know it, uh, was started. Uh, so suddenly there was this beginning of this tremendous sort of shift that, that, that had to happen, and I think a conflict, which is on the one hand, you had uh, a very strong sense of you know, puritanical Yankee uh, frugality, uh, colliding head-on with this world, this explosive world of material abundance and ever-increasing wages. And uh, I, I think to a much greater degree than uh, a lot of uh, current observers uh, give us credit for, uh, we are, most of us are still racked by that conflict. You know, it's easy to say that we spend and spend and spend, and again, many people do and they overspend. But for most people that I talk to, everyday people, normal people, people uh, out there, uh, there is still this, this uh, pleasure-pain principle at work. You know, we, we may spend money uh, freely uh, and often recklessly, but not without some feeling of anxiety or guilt. Um, and I mean, some people don't feel that, but a, a lot of people do feel that. And, and I think what's happening now, now that we're living in, in very challenging economic times, is that that pendulum uh, is swinging a little bit back. It's not going all the way back to waste not, want not, although there are anti-consumerists there out there who would have us do that. But, but going, swinging back from what, what in the book I call uh, a romantic form of shopping, which is shopping because uh, we are emotionally satisfied or aroused by the shopping, back to what I call sort of a classic mode of shopping, which is putting a premium on uh, all kinds of things such as practicality or utility or durability, getting fair uh, value uh, for a given price, getting quality for a price, uh, a more mindful kind of, of shopping. So, you know, I, I don't suggest, as I just said, that we're going to revert into some kind of a, a you know, a, a Victorian age of, of careful spending. But I do think that, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, some of those old values that we thought had you know, gone, gone away beginning in the 50s um, may, may well come back to at least occupy part of our, our psyches when we go into a store. The, the canard is, the cliché is that uh, women shop and men buy, which is to say, you know, Men are divided into these two categories. They're either grab and goers, you know, the guys who run in, where is it? I hate shopping. I'm out of here. Goodbye. Uh, or they're uh, classified as wait and whiners, you know, when they go out with their spouse or their partner. Uh, you, we've all seen them on a Saturday afternoon sitting there, you know, sullenly on a bench, if there is a bench in the department store, really grumpy that they have to, you know, be forced into, into doing that as opposed to 
lying on the couch watching ESPN on a Saturday afternoon. Um, so, so men have been cast as these characters who hate shopping. Uh, women, on the other hand, have been unfairly cast as these creatures who were built to shop, you know, who, who, who can barely tell the difference between shopping and entertainment or shopping as, uh, and recreation. Uh, so one of the things I did in connection with the book was to go shopping with a great many men and a great many women. And, and what I find is that, yeah, most men tend to be a little more impatient than women. Uh, but I found a great many women who liked nothing else than to grab and go and who really detested uh, the act of shopping. And I found a lot of men who, uh, while they wouldn't necessarily uh, you know, admit to it easily, really did like to shop. The, the other interesting thing about uh, men and women is that women, I think, have taken the rap for being shopaholics, um, for being compulsive buyers. And uh, there was a, a, a major study, probably the biggest study yet done on compulsive buying, uh, published last year. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was found that there are proportionately as many males who qualify as compulsive buyers as, as women. But men have, have an interesting dodge. You know, ask a man who, you know, acquires 200 digital cameras even though he never takes a photograph whether he's a compulsive buyer of digital cameras and he will say, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a shopaholic, I'm a collector. Uh, and I think men have been able to hide behind collecting uh, a little bit more successfully than women have in terms of, of maybe being out of control in terms of buying either a, a category of something or, or, or anything and everything. Um, you know, that said, there are some differences, uh, you know, statistically men hate to return things to stores. Um, uh, women return more, they, they buy more, they shop more, so they return more, but they also ha seem to have an easier psychological time returning to a store. Uh, men, when you ask them why, you know, you, you brought it home, it doesn't work, or you can't figure it out, or you, you, you bought it with too many features or buttons or, or, or options, you can't work it, why don't you just take it back? Men, men or, or it's just, or, or it's a thread is coming out, something is wrong, or it's the wrong size, uh, men will often not take it back to the store, and if you if you press them and say, well, well why not? Uh, well, you know, well, first of all, it means another trip back to the store, which you know, may be overwhelmingly too too tedious or onerous to do. Uh, but a lot of men f really um, fear the uh, a, the the confrontation that, that that almost never takes place at a store, but fear that there's going to be some kind of a conflict or a little bit of a conflict or confrontation. And they would just as soon um, avoid that. Now, in fact, most retailers or, or most good retailers uh, make returning things as hassle-free as possible because it's far better business to return something and not lose a customer for life than to give somebody a hard time over return of one object and never, you know never see that person again. So, so men have all of these fears. The other the other group, by the way, and it's it's a male and female group that that has a very high rate of unwillingness when it comes to returning things uh, are college students. Uh, and again, maybe some of the same reasons. They don't want the confrontation or they're too slothful or, or, or whatever it might be, but they don't return goods either. The, the, the cell site has a number of, you know, I'll call them tricks, but I don't necessarily mean they're uh, unethical, illegal, or really things that we don't easily see through, uh, you know. Um, there's a very, very deep uh, art and science to pricing, for example, which I, uh, you know, how do you set a price for something? And then how do you advertise a price? Uh, lots of studies have been done uh, on what kinds of offers, for example, uh, are likely to push us from, I don't want it to, oh, it looks like a pretty good thing, I'll, good deal, I'll, I'll buy it. Um, you know, if you are uh, generally a, somebody careful with his or her money, if, if you're kind of a, you know, sort of bordering on a cheapskate, studies have, have found that the mere insertion of the word only or just in front of a price will actually tip the balance in terms of whether a frugal person will buy something. So, you know, here's a sign that says $5, here's a sign that says only $5 or just $5. Uh, that one word will often make a bit of a difference. Uh, another thing that the sell side uh, does quite successfully is to um, plant suggestive, suggested reasons for why something might be useful. So, you know, the classic one is 101 uses, uh, or 
you know, buy one for a picnic, buy one to keep in the refrigerator, buy one for your car. You know, it, you, 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 you get a sense that, okay, it's pretty good to buy three of those because I'm going to get a lot of, you know, use out of it. Uh, a very, you know, well-known one, and it's ridiculous, uh, you know, in terms of both mathematics and logic is, you know, th three cans for six dollars, whereas you can buy, obviously, one can for two dollars. Uh, but just the fact that, I don't know, that the, the impression of the three, four um, sort of moves us away from what our original intent might have been, which is to buy one, uh, into another slightly different sort of cognitive realm, so we wind up being three. Now, none of those things uh, is necessarily, you know, wrong. I mean, it, it, they probably say more about how our brains work than about anybody's malevolent um, intent. The, the, other thing about, the other thing about pricing, maybe one of the more interesting things, I think, is that uh, consumers should be aware of how retailers and merchants can, can uh, play with... Um, three versions of something, uh, three different priced versions of something. Um, and uh, you see this in a lot of uh, different places, but very often, a, a, say, a, re a, a retailer might be offering th three jackets, three, three down jackets or something like that. And one it has a lot of features, and it's got, you know, a lot of down and a lot of zippers and a, a, a fur hood and, you know, some stuff. Uh, and that's you know two hundred dollars, you know, or whatever it might be. And then the same retailer might have a stripped down version of that uh, for uh, ninety nine dollars. Uh, it still has you know some down. It's got enough down to keep you warm. It's got a lot of zippers. There's no fur on the hood. Um, and it's you know your basic model of of that jacket. And then then there's a middle one that that has a little more down than the one on the bottom and a little less down. It uh, doesn't have fur, but it's, it feels pretty good. Maybe it comes in some uh, additional colors. And very often, <clears throat> what, why a retailer is doing that is not... He, he's very happy to sell you the expensive one. He's very happy to sell you the cheaper one. But generally speaking, what he's doing is trying to sell you that middle one. And he's probably bought many more of those middle ones. And the reason that tends to work is that uh, we, we reference the value of that middle one by the ones on the other on the, on the two extremes. And because there's an expensive version in the store, we, we immediately assume, uh, often rightly, that the store has really good things, really quality things, and, and, and the prices to prove it. Uh, at the same time, the, lower, uh, the lowest end one is a, it seems to be a really good value, so it's really not that high price. I can shop in this store pretty easily. Uh, so that middle one, we default to the middle one because it seems like a really, you know, we're in a nice place with good stuff, uh, but we're not in a place that's too expensive for us because of the cheaper one. So that middle one represents a really good value. It, it, in the trade, it's called the good, better, best strategy. Uh, but you also see it in, uh, you see it in a lot of different places. You know, when times are tough and if you walk into um, uh, a Coach leather goods store, for example, uh, Coach is a, a brilliant retailer at measuring their prices against the economic moment. And they know that in times like these, uh, people are not going to be spending many hundreds of dollars on, on a handbag, by and large. We might spend uh, a bit of money on a change purse or a small wallet or something like that. So what, what a coach will do and other stores will do is often take a very expensive bag, you know, bathe it in beautiful halogen light so that it shimmers and, and cast, in effect, a halo over what is placed around that expensive bag, which are you know smaller, low-priced items that presumably uh, we can better afford. So that that halo effect often happens in a store. You'll see it in Ralph Lauren a lot, where you you know there's an extraordinarily expensive leather bag, and it's surrounded by other things that are not necessarily inexpensive, but compared to that bag, you know even a $300 cashmere sweater seems pretty cheap. Of course, it isn't for most people. But it's, uh, it's a way that, that the retailer has of sort of relieving us of, of some of the guilt that might be attached uh, to buying a wallet that we don't really need or a cashmere sweater that's expensive but we can kind of afford. I, I make the same spending mistake um, uh, uh, over and over again. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a very inconsistent thing. I will go to a fair amount of trouble to um, do research on the most meaningless and inexpensive things, uh, a USB cable or you know, a 
12 AAA batteries. I mean, all these things that are not going to ruin my family's finances one way or the other. I'll actually research those. But then I will be totally and erratically spontaneous when it comes to booking uh, a vacation or a dinner, you know, something that's, that's expensive without doing a whole lot of um, due diligence. And I, I, I make that spending mistake over and over again to the point at least that, you know, I haven't broken the family's piggy bank, but uh, from time to time I, you know, I, t I test it. Um, having said that, I think I'm, a, I'm not a profligate buyer. I think I'm a fairly typical buyer in that I am given to irrationality um, and uh, wildly inconsistent.